Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, whatever you're um, listening to this discussion from. Um, so we are starting um, this panel now that it is entitled uh, Religious Leaders Influence Lessons from the Field, uh, Colombia, the Democratic Republic of Congo and Myanmar. Uh, my name is Ezekiel Hefes. I'm, I'm going to be chairing this panel. Um, which will be will consist of three great presentations. Um, first, we're going to be listening to uh, Dr. Pier Giuseppe Parisi, uh, who's going to be speaking also on behalf of Ms. Yolvi Lena on the role of religious uh, of Christian religious actors in the Colombian conflict, from visible influencers to discrete protagonists. Then, after uh, Pier Giuseppe, we're going to be listening to uh, Dr. Mulanda Jimmy Huma. Um, uh, who's going to be speaking about the influence of Congolese religious organizations on, on armed conflicts in the Democratic Republic of Congo, lessons from the field. And last but not least, we're going to be listening to uh, Mr. Uh, Christopher Rush, who's going to be speaking, if I'm not mistaken, also on behalf of Dr. Joanna Chisnes on the relational influence between religious actors and the Kachin Independence Organization Army. Uh, so the way I have thought about this uh, to make something um, rather dynamic is to first give the floor to, to Pierre Giuseppe, who's going to be speaking about Colombia. I'm going to come and give some, some, some feedback and some questions on his presentation. And then I, we proceed in the same way with, with uh, Mulanda and, and, and Chris. And then we leave the last, I hope, um, around 20 minutes for uh, questions from the audience that I, I strongly encourage you to to share in the in the chat box um i'm sure you're gonna have a few because the presentations are quite practical and and those that i've read i mean the the, the, the information i've read i think it's quite enlightening so I, I i look forward very much to these discussions so um without further ado i give the floor to pierre hello again and Thanks again for, again for having me. Um, first of all, let me start by uh, conveying um, Yolvi's apologies. Unfortunately, she's not feeling well, so that's why she hasn't been able to join us. Um, but I will try and cover uh, some of the um, some of the issues that she was supposed to um, cover. Um, if I fail with timekeeping, please, uh, as I can, um, call me to order because obviously I haven't practiced that. Um, Anyway, I'm going to try to uh, share uh, my presentation again. Here we go. You should be able to see it. Yes, we can. Yes, that's great. So <clears throat> uh, first of all, let me let me start by uh, saying that um, I think that probably um, if we go, if we could go back in time, we would have added a, a small word at the end of this title. We would have said from visible influencers to discrete protagonists and back, uh, because really what we um, what we are trying to do in this paper, and again, it's in a way this is more of an exploratory paper that will inform some of the um, field work that we will be doing in Colombia, um, COVID permitting, um, in the new year. Uh, but it's basically to understand um, what we have observed uh, as being a sort of an increased commitment of the Catholic Church in particular in Colombia since the 90s. Um, the background to this is basically that um, obviously um, if we look at the Colombian conflict that has come basically for more than 50 years, we have seen uh, different ways of the uh, Colombian Catholic Church of engaging with um, um, armed groups and more generally of taking positions in relation to the conflict. But it's really from the 90s and probably even more in the past couple of decades that the, that the Catholic Church has started to uh, engage with uh, armed groups in a more uh, institutionalized way. And so our, our question is why? Why is that the case? Um, um, I mean, for those of you who are not uh, particularly familiar with the Colombian conflict, we are talking about like a, a, an armed conflict, actually se different, several armed conflict that have been going on for uh, over 50 years and that um, have produced um, over 9 million victims. 
um, according to the um, Unidad de Victimas uh, in, uh, in Colombia, which is basically an, an, an agency of the state which deals with uh, victims' issues. Um, and while there have been um, throughout the entire um, conflict several attempts at uh, brokering a peace process between the government and different armed groups, uh, the, um, well, many of these processes have in fact failed and, the, and most importantly, the structural causes of the armed conflict uh, persist and have even intensified in some cases. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's sufficient to remember that uh, the um, territorial disputes them and as well as a number of, um, um, uh, let's say, national and international circumstances determine the, uh, the rise of uh, guerrilla groups, and then um, later on, the uh, sort of uh, part of the response of, uh, you know, the covert response allegedly of the uh, government has been also the establishment of paramilitary groups. Um, but I'm not going to go too, too much into detail in that uh, history. Um, and <clears throat> in a way, the, the conflict itself has been fueled by several actors, economic actors, political actors, but also the Catholic Church. Um, the Catholic Church, uh, and in particular some, um, I, I wouldn't say necessarily uh, institutionally, but uh, definitely some, uh, um, uh, some members of the Catholic Church in Colombia uh, actively, um, proactively sort of uh, contributed to fueling uh, the conflict um, in, um, since its inception in some way. Um, and, However, uh, a number of um, uh, circumstances that sort of uh, developed, especially starting from the, um, from the uh, I'd say the 80s and then the 90s, national and international circumstances uh, have started to sort of compound the need for the church to recognize its active um, um, role in the conflict and in the uh, victimization of um, um, civilian populations. Um, <clears throat> now, <clears throat> um, since the, let's say, a, a sort of a, a turning point has been the uh, adoption of the, uh, poli the Constitución Política, the Constitution of, of, the, uh, of Colombia in 1991, which for the first time um, declare basically the, the separation between the state and uh, religion. So basically um, embrace the principle of secularism. Um, and um, that obviously has seen a um, initially like a, a diminishing of the public role, if you wish, of the church. Um, and um, this, um, decrease of the public role of the church has been a, has been addressed in part by the church by an increasing engagement uh, in uh, um, in um, with the issues concerned with issues belonging let's say to, to the conflict and, and and the different peace processes that, that have been initiated across the um, past 30 years and nowadays I think that there is no doubt that the church basically um, is, recognized as a humanitarian actor, as a fundamental humanitarian actor uh, in Colombia. Um, and especially when it comes to uh, initiatives that are aimed at basically accompanying uh, the civilian population and protecting particular uh, local populations in the different territories um, of uh, Colombia. Now, <clears throat> this um, in a way, this change, uh, this turn um, that occurred, um, I would say at the beginning of the 1991 is obviously be being triggered by the adoption of the uh, political constitution, as I said. Um, um, this, um, the adoption of the political constitution in some way by embracing the principle of secularism relegated uh, the, the, um, the church to um, a, a more marginal role within uh, within society, and so that determined a need for the church to re um, um, regain uh, public visibility in in some way. So obviously, uh, this is one of the uh, I suppose one of the um, possible 
explanations for the um, increasing engagement of the um, Catholic Church in issues relating to the conflict and in particular with negotiations in negotiations with uh, armed groups. The second um, uh, possible explanation that we identified is this uh, search for a position of neutrality. Um, I'm not going to linger on that right now because I think uh, th that's going to be like the object of the next uh, slide. I, wanna, I, I want to untangle this principle of neutrality a bit more uh, in depth. Um, and so I'm going to skip to the third um, potential explanation, which is basically um, which is concerned basically with the risks that religious actors belonging to the Catholic Church have been experiencing as a, um, as a result of their uh, active involvement in uh, negotiations and in uh, um, uh, humanitarian action, essentially. Um, I think that the, the latest data, um, well, actually, it's not that late, well, they, the, the center the Centro de Memoria Historica, the Center of Mem um, um, Historical Memory of Colombia documented in 2019 that between 1982 and 2012, um, 500, there, there, have, there were like 589 cases of victimization of religious leaders or uh, uh, faith communities. Um, over several, um, several dozens of these cases, were actually uh, uh, cases of uh, assassinations as well. And I suppose that this kind of um, points to the um, idea that the Catholic Church um, has also in some way recognized their um, um, being a victim themselves, like an active part in the conflict in the sense that they, uh, by engaging with uh, these actors, they, they've also suffered um, uh, they've also suffered victimization. Um, and this when it comes to physical risks, but obviously the, um, there are other risks that come from the legislative framework uh, that was adopted in Colombia, especially at the beginning of 2000. Um, the uh, law uh, number 70, uh, 782 of 2002, which was approved under the uh, former um, government of President um, Alvaro Uribe um, determined um, that, in a way, reaffirmed the power of the state as the main uh, broker of peace and negotiations uh, with uh, the armed doctor. So basically, no humanitarian organization, no individual uh, no in social institution could engage in these uh, negotiations without the, pre the prior um, um, uh, authorization by the government. Um, and even um, in, in, our, in our research, we, we saw that also humanitarian uh, organizations, including, for example, um, I think Geneva Call, were not able to engage uh, in negotiations um, at some point with, uh, with the armed groups. Um, uh, following, let's say, following basically these um, um, restrictive uh, uh, provisions. However, the actor that remained a close ally of the government, or better, the, the actor which the government was relying on throughout this period was the church. Why? Um, and that brings me to uh, the um, second point that I was mentioning before, because of this concept of neutrality. Um, neutrality, as, it's been, as it has been interpreted by the church, uh, by the Catholic Church in, uh, in Colombia, um, is underpinned basically by three fundamental positions. On the one hand, uh, first of all, the rejection of violence as a means to achieve political objectives, no matter what the, uh, whether these political objectives were altruistic or not. Um, secondly, the recognition of the need uh, to, of the church to ask forgiveness for their own responsibilities in the conflict, especially prior to their um, heightened commitment to uh, peace talks and negotiations. And three, the commitment to accompany um, uh, population, the population that are mostly affected by the conflict. Now, if these are the three pillars that in some way underpin neutrality, we asked what kind of neutrality are we talking about? Um, 
And um, I think that we, we identified three ways of understanding this neutrality. One is, in a, in a way, akin to the neutrality that is typical of humanitarian organizations working in conflict situations. So they need to basically provide um, assistance, humanitarian, humanitarian assistance for uh, populations that are in need, that suffer. Um, but then uh, neutrality is understood also in a, in a more, if you wish, like opportunistic or institutional way as a source of legitimacy. And so as a mean to, um, as I said, regain that role, the public role in society. Um, and finally, third, and neutrality also have a strong link with the, um, if you wish, with the theology uh, of the Catholic Church globally, um, and so as a as a it has a, a substantive content to it. It's not just a a, 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 a a sort of institutional or procedural understanding of neutrality, and I think it's important to cite in this regard the um, apostolic. Um, um, the, ap the apostolic exhortation of uh, Pope Francis of 2013, which uh, basically rejects uh, violence as a form um, of um, uh, resolution of conflicts, um, no matter what the root causes of these conflicts are. Of course, this neutrality doesn't come, this, this understanding of neutrality doesn't come without uh, problems. Um, and as a matter of fact, for example, um, uh, when uh, it came to uh, sort of providing a platform for the dialogues that basically led them to the uh, referendum, um, well, the plebiscite, the, the plebiscite in relation to the um, peace agreement in 2016, the, Col the Colombian church assumed a very uh, sort of um, neutral, uh, in, in a negative sense, sort of position without uh, sort of pronouncing themselves uh, in favor or against the peace agreement. Uh, which obviously was the source of uh, a lot of criticism. Um, I think I'm going to stop here because I think I've exhausted my time uh, and I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you very much, Pierre. That was that was a very interesting and enlightening um, exchange and, and of information. I thought it was very, very uh, interesting for various reasons. And Perhaps I have two two comments when I was listening to your presentation and reading to your paper. Is uh, the first one I think is very interesting how um, the the Catholic Church in Colombia has evolved in its relation with the parties to the conflict from the very beginning. I mean, this is something that you you actually mentioned in the paper. You haven't mentioned now, but in in the in the fifties, in the sixties, how it related to different actors, are non-state actors mostly. How the, the theology of liberation influenced the, the, the creation and constitution of, of, of the National Liberation Army, for instance. Um, so I think, I think it's, it's interesting uh, how, how it evolved, and I think it, it goes to the core of the title of your presentation, right? That this evolution and how, this, and how the Catholic Church, Church has changed the way it dealt with, um, with the parties to the conflict. And so in relation to this, I, I thought it's it was quite interesting, the point that you, that you raised in terms of considering the, the Catholic Church as, an, as a humanitarian actor. And the question that I had is whether, I mean, you know, the, the humanitarian actors everywhere in the world, they have certain limitations to engage with, with parties to the conflict. For instance, it could be due to security guarantees or it could be to, um, because the, the party doesn't want to listen to that humanitarian actor, the unwillingness of the party to listen to that humanitarian actor. And I was wondering whether you see or you think that there could be some similar scenarios when dealing with the Catholic Church in Colombia, for instance. I don't know, you, you, you may think that there could be an actor that doesn't want to um, engage with the Catholic Church for any particular reason or uh, they don't want to have the Catholic Church in the villages that they control because of a particular reason. If there is something there that, you know, in terms of accessing those peoples in need, that could be also be um, reflected from the perspective of the traditional humanitarian actor. And the second one is that I thought it was quite interesting. Um, I mean, when, when I try to, to, to think about how, again, um, 
when actually when we discuss about the relation between the Catholic Church and how they accompany populations, how they relate with the parties, I don't know why, for me, a reflex is to think mostly in terms of uh, armed groups and how they would relate to armed groups because of some of the points that you have identified and some of the issues that you also include in the paper. And I wonder if you have reflections with respect to the relation between the Catholic Church and the state forces. Um, if uh, there have been, I don't know, perhaps there are bilateral discussions on humanitarian issues, or perhaps uh, I, I, I may think that uh, the, the, the local priest uh, may have a good relation at, at the local level with the, the, the commander of the armed forces. But I don't know if at the national level there have been, there might be some institutions or there might be something there. And last but not least, I, perhaps you can you can share a few thoughts on uh, the participation of religious leaders in the whole transitional justice process in Colombia, which I also think it's it's quite important because it, it goes beyond the pers this perspective of engaging during the conflict, but also participating in peace building and and uh, engaging also in in, in in possibly humanitarian commitments after. Um, hostilities have ceased. So these three points are from my side. I would really like to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Ezekiel. Um, so I'm going to start from the first one, which is basically, I, I suppose it goes to the um, to the issue, how does the Catholic Church, when, when the Catholic Church sort of engages with um, armed groups at the local level, what is it that, uh, that transfer legitimacy to them in dealing with them. No, um, I think one of the, um, I mean, again, like this is kind of hypothetical and, and it will definitely be something that we will explore when we will be on the field. But my impression so far is that um, if you look at like humanitarian missions, for example, that have been established in the last uh, few years, uh, you can see that generally um, religious organizations uh, are always accompanied by local organizations that work, for example, on specific issues uh, that um, affect the territory in some way. The example is, I think the most rec recent example has been a round of humanitarian missions that were uh, conducting in, conducted in Chocó and Antioquia uh, throughout 2021 whereby different religious organizations that um, have both a sort of national, uh, that are rooted both in the, in, in the national infrastructure and in the local infrastructure have collaborated, for example, with indigenous um, uh, organizations or, uh, for example, human rights organizations that work really at the local level. I think uh, that and, and, and it's not certainly something that is uh, only um, typical of Colombia. It's something that we can find in other contexts. For example, uh, one thing that I didn't mention this morning when I, when I was talking about Mali is precisely this link between the national level and the local level. So the need to have intermediaries that in some way provide legitimacy to uh, whatever action the, the church is conducting at the local level. So that would be my that would be my take on your first question. I hope that kind of answer what you were uh, looking uh, for. Um, the I'm going to move on to the third one. So uh, the participation of religious leaders in transitional justice efforts. I think that's definitely a significant issue. I mean, if you think that the um, that the Truth Commission is basically uh, led by um, a, a priest. Um, that, of course, um, is um, is indicative in some way of the of the role of uh, the Catholic Church and and probably of the of the role of uh, forgiveness as a you know as a, as a theological concept in relation to um, also. Um, um, human rights violations and situation of atrocities basically uh, play. Um, the Truth Commission itself, so the, the transitional justice efforts have, all, um, have also been like, a, um, if you wish, like a forum and opportunity, providing an opportunity and a platform for um, um, religious actors and the Catholic Church in particular to start acknowledging also their role in the conflict. Um, so, for example, I can't remember exactly the date, but uh, um, one of the one of the um, 
um, well, first of all, there's a report, um, I think, that has been uh, elaborated by the, by the Truth Commission in relation to precisely the, the role of the Catholic Church in the conflict. But I think there have been a number of uh, acts of, I suppose, public recognition of the responsibility of the, of the church in the conflict. No? Um, and it, it's quite interesting also from a legal viewpoint that there has been an increasing push by um, sectors of the sections of the uh, church that have participated in this transitional justice efforts to recognize for example, the responsibility for omission uh, of the church um, in, in, within the conflict. Um, I still think that it kind of falls short of a full accountability process because obviously it doesn't recognize the active participation of religious actors, of Catholic actors in the, um, sometimes even in, you know, in the perpetration of um, uh, human rights violations. Uh, and then moving on to the, um, your second question, so whether at the state level there has been essentially an engagement, um, I, I mean, I'm, I think I would gloss over this question in some way. I'm not entirely sure I'm able to provide um, a, a comprehensive answer to this. I, um, I wish that Yovi was here to uh, sort of assist me in this. Uh, I, I mean, definitely, of course, you have to consider that we, we're talking about Colombia, a, a country that has very strong Catholic uh, roots since the uh, coloniz colonization by the Spanish, um, which basically, um, um, yeah, and, and the sort of, what is the term in, uh, in English? Uh, Catholicization, evangelization, I suppose, of the, of the country. Um, uh, and um, yeah, but yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll, I, I've just seen your message that we, we need to close, so <laughs> I'll stop there. Sorry, otherwise I can. Thank you very much, Karen. No, I mean, uh, and, and of course uh, we can continue. Uh, I hope that we're gonna have a few minutes before the panel is over to keep uh, having these discussions. Now I, I would like to turn the floor to uh, Dr. Mulanda Jimmy Juma who's going to be speaking about the influence of Congolese religious organizations, specifically uh, in, the, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, good morning and good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to, to hear uh, Dr. Pesci from Colombia and uh, building on what he has uh, just uh, shared with us. Uh, I want to begin by saying thank you very much to the organizers. And I'm sending my thank yous to Jelena and uh, Ioana for facilitating the communication in preparation for this. Uh, my topic is uh, focusing on the influence of uh, Congolese religious organizations on armed conflict in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And I'll be sharing um, some of the results of my research as well as uh, from my own uh, personal experience of being in, in the integration uh, of former combatant as, as I look at uh, this, uh, this particular topic. Um, the Democratic Republic of Congo is uh, is uh, located at the heart of the African continent. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's located at the heart of the African continent. And uh, the most of the, the armed conflict uh, are actually in the eastern part of, of the country where you have Goma, Bukavu, Kisangani, uh, that is the side of the country where you have uh, most of the, the armed groups. So what, it, what are the objectives of this? Is to, to assess the, the nature of, uh, to assess the, the, the nature uh, of uh, armed uh, conflict affecting the DRC, to explore uh, former combatants as actors in the armed conflict in the DRC to discuss the operationalization of the former competent reintegration 
in the community through a humanitarian response and the role uh, that the religious organizations uh, play in that process. And to explain key factors uh, contributing positively or negatively on the influence of Congolese religious organizations on the parties in armed conflict in the DRC. Uh, as I said earlier on, this, as far as methodology is concerned, uh, this research is actually based on uh, field work uh, that I did in 2012 and uh, my experience from 2017 up to this. Um, it's an explore interviews, focus group discussion, tools that are used to collect uh, data in areas like Bukavu, Bunyakiri, Kale, Fizi, Goma, Ubira, Mwenga, and Walikale in Eastern Congo. Um, many of you, uh, if not all of you, know that Congo has had uh, a long war uh, since uh, uh, 1996. And currently there are over 100 armed groups uh, active armed groups in uh, in the country uh, already in uh, in 2012 when I was doing my research there were over 300,000 combatants some were demobilized uh, but others were not and there are there were new uh, combatants who actually joined new armed groups as well so I still estimate that this number is still valid to to this day um, some of the organizations uh, involved in, uh, in this process uh, of reintegration, uh, I'm, I'm here by saying religious uh, organizations, uh, assistant to orphan children, uh, Caritas, the Church of Christ in Congo, and the Program for Peace and, uh, for peace and Reconciliation and the Office of Support and Development. For this particular presentation, I'll focus more on the Church of Christ in Congo and PPR um, as, as I explore the influence of religious uh, leaders. And the, my understanding of the role that they play is actually based on understanding that if you do not share your healing with the wounded, the wounded will share their wound with you. And so religious organizations are actually driven by this understanding that they have to play a role to make communities safe, to end the violence, so that we can be able to live in peace, to have development, to protect human rights. Um, and there are two focuses here when it comes to influence. One is decision-making and planning of interventions. And the second is the implementation of those interventions uh, to disarm, to demobilize, and to reintegrate former combatants in the community. So to begin with, as far as decision-making and planning of intervention to disarm, to demobilize, and to reintegrate former combatants in uh, uh, communities, religious organizations, and I will take the example of ECC uh, and PPR, they do not participate at the higher level of the decision-making where these decisions are being made. It's the government and the international actors taking part in that process because it takes, uh, part, uh, it it takes place at a, a very high political level of negotiations. So they don't participate in setting up the agenda of what is going to happen in dealing with the question of ex combatant of course, when it's time to, for negotiations with the armed groups, they are invited to be part of that process, to facilitate the process. And this leads me to the second point and, and on which I will focus a little bit more, and that is the, 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 uh, the implementation of intervention. So my framework is actually based on uh, the International Council of Human Rights Policy, which uh, was uh, published an article published in 2005, where the, the, the services provided 
were actually based on availability, accessibility, adaptability, and accept acceptability. Um, the first point is accessibility. The religious, when it comes to accessibility, we're looking at who actually is accessible, what is accessible, and who makes things accessible. In this case, uh, when it comes to, to accessibility, we are going to see that uh, there are some positive factors that lead or add to the influence of religious uh, organizations. For example, lo local religious organizations as actors in this process are more accessible than foreign and government uh, actors in the process of accessing to uh, having access to former combatant and combatant and armed groups. And this is because you will find churches everywhere. You will find their structures everywhere. They are also accessible because they understand the needs. They understand the leaders. They understand those actors very well, better than anybody else. Uh, they are generally trusted by those groups. And in, there are places where only those leaders can actually have access. And what is negative in terms of factors is actually uh, the, the, the limitation of extent to which local actors can deliver services to those uh, demobilized, for example. That is a limitation. As a result, there's a situation whereby many organizations uh, may not reach out and provide uh, necessary services to combatant who are demobilized as part of this, this process. And the second is availability. What is actually made available? What is made available as far as positive factors are concerned with the, the religious organization is actually the, 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 uh, the welcoming of former combatant in the community. So they are able to welcome them. They, were, they are able to create structures that can help ex combatant to reintegrate back into the community. For example, uh, creating structures where they can be part of income generating activities, for example, in the community. Um, and that is a positive factor. But the negative or the limitation in this for the religious organization is that they are limited in terms of how much they can actually make available because they depend mostly on foreign assistance. Um, adaptability, their services are more adaptable uh, simply because, for example, when it comes to issues of trauma, they can create those structures where this ex-combatant can feel heard, trusted, and be part of the process rather than bringing outside or um, approaches from outside of the, the context. These will be like parties, these will be like going to the river, going to places in the forest where there are resources for trauma healing. Acceptability, as far as acceptability is concerned, religious leaders are more accepted than any other organization in this particular context. Now, we can go to the last uh, slide as, as I end this presentation. Um, local ownership. What I want to say here is that there are two sides of local ownership in this compass. Local leaders, religious leaders, don't really own the process of reintegration and that limits their influence. And because their influence is limited, there is high insecurity because the more there is local ownership, or the more the local ownership grows, the, the, the more human security grows. And the more human uh, local ownership reduces, the more human security reduces as well. And this, the, the, the balance here is based on, 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 on how much uh, local religious organizations are able to provide in this process. 
uh, because of the time, I will end my presentation here and I will be open uh, to, to questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing this this very interesting uh, presentation on your perspective on the DRC. So as, as we did with uh, Pierre before, uh, perhaps I'm gonna ask you uh, one or two questions that I, I um, I was reflecting about when I was reading your piece, and then we're going to give the floor to, to, to Chris, and then we're going to open for questions and answers from, from the audience. Uh, I had one point when I was reading your piece, I thought it was very interesting the way you address how different uh, religious organizations are working with former members of, of armed groups in, in the DRC, and I was particularly interested in the activities that you were listing. So on whether they were doing food distribution or they were doing uh, other types of projects uh, with, with these individuals. And my question is, if you think that um, the relevance of this organization is because of the religion that they expose or because of the activities that they propose. So is it because it's a Catholic organization or is it because they are proposing um, I don't know, a, a type a distribution of food or, or they are proposing a certain activity and because of that is that they actually get the acceptance by these individuals. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your question, um, Ezekiel. The, their relevance is actually based on the fact that they come from the same context. They understand the context better and they are trusted by the beneficiaries of their services. The, the distribution of food, the trauma healing interventions adds more value to that relevance. So it is an additional component to, to, adding to, to add to the relevance of those uh, actors. In this case, we're talking of uh, the Council of Christian Churches, the Protestant Church in the Congo. Do they, do they share the religion with the beneficiaries, for instance? Is this something that, or they are open to everyone? And how does that relate, if there is any relation? Yeah, when it comes to the question of accessibility, for example, who access their resources, they are open to sphere principles of humanity. And so it's everybody who is in the similar situation, especially the most vulnerable people, among the, the beneficiaries, those are the ones who are targeted. Great, and I have a last question because now it's like it, this discussion is, is open me other questions, is whether there is a coordination between religious organizations, as there, there is a coordination between humanitarian actors in, in certain conflict areas, maybe I know, religious actors doing these activities uh, with the same type of beneficiary, they meet up every, I don't know, every month to discuss about their what the challenges that they've been facing uh, or the successes that they've been they've been encountering uh, in this particular context in uh, in congo there is what we call is called the act alliance it's actually a platform of religious organizations meeting meeting uh, regularly to talk about their intervention the challenges in the in the field and strategizing together and you know sharing opportunities for funding and, and other other uh, networking uh, opportunities uh, they are also part of the ocha meeting for example which organized through the united nations organizations um yeah excellent thank you very much so we're going to come back after uh, this last presentation when we open uh to everyone for for questions i encourage the audience to um, ask your questions in the chat box and then we're going to address them um, after uh, this last presentation. So if you have questions for um, Pierre Giuseppe or for uh, Mulanda on, on the DRC and, and Colombia, or if you have questions for Chris on, on Myanmar, uh, please do not hesitate to include them. Um, so uh, without any, any, any other delay, um, Chris? Thanks, Ezekiel. Thank, you. Thank you very much. And also, yes, congratulations to everyone. Um, who's making this conference a really interesting event. Um, just to get my presentation up. <clears throat> so we're looking um, in the last, in this last section on um, the situation interface between 
uh, religious and armed actors in Myanmar. Um, and I think the first thing I should mention is that um, this, what I'll be talking about this afternoon is uh, a part of a much bigger whole in relation to the work that's been going on uh, about Myanmar. Um, we've been looking at conflicts throughout the country um, since the research began uh, at the beginning of last year. Um, and I think, I, I think it's also quite important to emphasize that a lot of the research um, has been carried out before the significant events that took place earlier this year uh, with the military coup. Um, and we're, the research is still ongoing, so we are looking to adapt um, and to try to also understand um, some, of the, some of our research questions in response to some of the developments that have taken place in the last, um, in the last nine or 10 months. Um, the focus of the presentation today will be on one of the armed conflicts that we, we've been looking at, which is an, a long-term armed conflict that's been going on since the 1960s between the Kachin Independence Organization and Army uh, up in the north of, Myan of Myanmar, um, and its fights against the successive governments uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the country, um, and particularly its behavior during the, that conflict. Um, I would also mention that there's a number of religious actors that are active in these conflict affected regions, but we'll primarily be focused on uh, the Christian churches and, um, and their roles. So in terms of the, the question, the research questions we asked ourselves, um, the first one is what, what activities and interpretations have religious actors developed that actually have a bearing on humanitarian norms? And this is like, a, obviously, this is the fundamental fundamental part of the generating respect project uh, question that we're trying to we're trying to find answers to. Um, and in terms not only about what what are the actual messages and what what are the interpretations, um, are they having an impact and what you know what is happening with the conflict parties? Are they modifying their behaviour due to these interpretations? And if so, in what ways? Um, and then. Related to that, what factors are actually shaping the influence of these religious actors on the conflict parties? You know, trying to understand what what works and what doesn't work. Um, now, I'm not not pretending that this presentation is going to give you full answers to all, all of those questions, but I think there's some there's some food for for thought from what we've uh, what we've learned to date. Um, the methodology that we've used for this is a uh, desk-based research uh, and a series of key informant interviews with. Uh, identified uh, um, experts um, in a lot of different fields who actually uh, um, work in and on, on the country. So in terms of the conceptual framework for the, this research, uh, we, ba we base our research on an assumption that re religious leaders are claiming a special legitimacy to interpret religion um, and that that legitimacy is anchored in both tradition and charisma. Um, and that the influence that these leaders would have on, on armed actors um, is a process that's, that's actually uh, got two, uh, um, two aspects to it, one of which are intrinsic factors, um, such as shared ideology, religion, social and ethnic factors. Um, and secondly, that in, in um, different uh, contexts, other factors will also come into play, um, such as the type of conflict, the, the way that conflict has actually um, uh, played out, different dynamics, the security situation, et cetera. And indeed, as, as we'll see, uh, I think we found that in relation to the, uh, the influence of religious actors on the, on the KIO, KIA, that, that, that both intrinsic and contextual factors um, have, have been relevant. Just a quick photo. You've this shouldn't be uh, unknown to anyone because this is actually, I think, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a picture that's being used in the Generating Respect Project uh, conference uh, publicity. Um, just to let you know what, what that is, it's actually a photo from Kitchen State. Um, I should be, mention it's not actually directly related to the KIO conflict. It's a picture from immediately after the, the military coup, where there were demonstrations against the military coup. Um, 
and those demonstrations were met with quite severe violence um, or very severe violence and um, in one instance a nun went out to um, to speak to the to the police uh, who were the uh, instigators of, of that violence uh, to try to get them to uh, to actually uh, stop those attacks um, I think you can see from that picture um, that there is um, some influence that that nun has on on those police uh, uh, the, the policemen that are there um, albeit obviously as we know from um, what's happened since then um, that that influence is perhaps not as uh, um, as decisive as, as perhaps we would all like like it to be but I think it's a uh, an illustrative illustrative of a level of power that religious leaders can hold over over armed actors so in terms of what the one issue that we will look at is the use and recruitment of children um, the KIA as are many armed actors uh, that have been operating in, uh, in Myanmar uh, has been listed by the UN Secretary General as a party that uses and recruits children and that listing has been in place since since um, well nearly 25 years since 2007 um, but I think it's significant that since 2017 there's been a, um, there's, there's been a caveat put in, in that listing whereby uh, they've put, been put in the list where they're acknowledged to have put in measures aimed at improving the protection of children um, so I think that's something that we'll, that we'll, uh, we'll, we'll come on to consider you know why, why is why, why is it that the KIO has uh, started taking those measures? So I think that um, what's, what's important um, to, to, uh, to, to, to realize is that research indicates that in the last decade, there's been an increased awareness um, of international standards on this issue by key stakeholders um, and I think it's quite easy to see the visibility particularly in, um, at the international level there's a there's a lot of uh, well as well as the listing I've mentioned the secretary general's listing that takes place every year which is which is quite a visible process there's a lot of human rights organizations that are, uh, are shining a light on the, these issues um, and there are other um, international and national actors that are also looking to engage with parties um, in relation to the non-use and recruitment of children so that's definitely it, um, it, it you know is, is definitely a, a factor in this but it's also important and not always as visible to know that, uh, but that civil society and religious actors have also been instrumental in this uh, increased um, uh, visibility of, of this subject and topic and um, and have contributed to um, the KIO taking those steps that I've, that I've mentioned. Um, just to give you some quotes from a couple of key informants in, in relation to this issue. Um, so the first one, it's very much the importance of religious leaders and other civil society actors in making those connections with those international actors um, and in facilitating and, and uh, uh, making sure that those con those contacts are made, and I think that's often what we see. Um, um, at, you know, certainly as uh, um, humanitarian actors, um, you know, and I speak I speak as a, a former one myself. Um, it's absolutely vital to to make those connections to uh, to actually have those uh, um, those actors at the um, at the local level to facilitate that process. But I think this goes beyond that, and I. Think that um, I think the second quote is important in that respect. Um, that there are conversations happening where religious leaders are are involved, and these are these aren't conversations that we're party to. They're conversations that are happening behind closed closed doors that, that are seeking to um, um, encourage and support um, steps to be taken. So, so in relation to the factors involved in in this, you know, what what are what are the factors that make the religious actors um, influential on, on armed actors and looking at the KIO 
um, example. We, we can certainly say shared religious belief. Um, it may seem the most obvious. Um, to give you an example, most of the KIO leadership are Baptists, and the, the Kachin Baptist Convention is perhaps the most influential of all of the religious actors in the in the um, in the north. Um, however, um, I would also say that even though that's been identified by a lot of key informants, nobody we spoke to thought that that was the only the only uh, factor, or, 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 or even the main factor involved in this. That there are several other factors which I'll I'll, uh, I'll address one by one. Um, Related to re religious belief is also a shared cultural influence and, and political proximity. Um, the churches, particularly the Baptist churches, played a key role in uh, keeping the sense of kachinness um, um, alive in the in the context, um, and is, has been involved in promoting kachin language at a time when there when there's been a resistance against a, what you might call a, a a Bamanization or and a Buddhistization of the country. So the church has actually stood with other actors to actually resist that process. Um, and this feeds into the next point about the political proximity that the, uh, particularly the Baptist uh, Convention, the Kachin Baptist Convention, um, does share very strong ethno nationalistic views, um, similar in, in many ways to that of the KIO. Um, so I, I think these are very, very important in terms of um, that actor's influence on, on the actual, uh, on the organization. Um, but as, as well as these intrinsic factors, I think it's really, really important to actually also understand that, that there's some contextual factors which are also really relevant and also have, have some weight. Um, one of the things which is really, uh, at first, at first flush seems a, a bit anomalous in uh, the Kachin context is that the, the KIO KIA is, is a very militarized structure. I mean, it, it, that's ob obvious in terms of, a, of the armed wing, the KIA, but even the KIO side of things is also very, very militarized, a lot more than some of the other ethnic armed organizations that operate in the country. Um, and it would be easy just to assume that because of that, it would mean that, um, that they, would, they would be less uh, likely to, to listen to outside voices. But but there are reasons um, related to the history of the organization, and particularly um, uh, the cease, a previous ceasefire period where a previous leadership was seen as being relatively self-serving and, and enriching, enriching themselves and not actually um, uh, listening to the needs of the people. The KIO actually does have quite a sophisticated consultative process and, and this I think um, really facilitates particularly the religious actors in relation to their uh, influence um, over the KIO. Um, another aspect of contextual factors, the the religious um, church, so this is not only the, uh, the Baptists but also the Catholics, they share, they're actually physically proximate to the population, they, they you know, going back to something that uh, Pierre Giuseppe was, was mentioning they they're they're sharing the suffering often of the people on the ground. Um, so in in relation to that aspect, this also gives them a level of um, a, a level of uh, leverage, and this is also related to non-religious activities that they actually conduct. Um, there's a for, for various historic reasons, religious actors have been involved in a lot of. Uh, assistance actions over the years in, in many, many different ways, and are particularly uh, important in ensuring that assistance um, reaches displaced populations. So this also gives them um, um, oh, sorry, um, an amount of leverage. Um, and related to that means that they've actually got a large constituency, um, not just, you know, both in terms of people of their faith, but also people that are the beneficiaries of their um, of, of, of their um, assistance, and that's not always uh, exactly um, anomal or exactly um, the, the same. That you know, Catholic people can be, can also be getting assistance from Baptist organisations, and vice versa. Um, so I think this is a really important aspect, and I've got to say that those contextual factors, those 
particularly the physical proximity and the non-religious activities um, uh, and their influence over the constituency. These two elements have have been really uh, important in relation to the Catholic Church, particularly, um, and the, their, their influence and their importance um, in, in the context. And the last, the last aspect I think, which is uh, worthy of note, um, is of a slightly different nature, but I think is also really important. And again, this is a um, something that Dr. Melanda was mentioning in, in his presentation. It's the actual influencing skills of these individuals. These are very, very um, savvy operators. You know, I mean, I, I don't want to sort of detract from the importance of what they're doing, but they uh, they know how to influence. They they know the people very, very well that they're trying to influence, um, and they know what to say and what not to say. Um, so um, these kind of what you might call uh, influence influencing skills are absolutely vital in relation to um, um, that kind of uh, that leverage. Um, so I also am aware of the time, so I'll, I shall leave it there and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris, for this presentation. Um, so as before, I mean, I'm, I'm going to share a few thoughts and then I know that there is already a question for you in the chat box. So what, what we can do is to start uh, the other way uh, uh, around as we as we've started. So instead of starting with Pierre and then uh, Mulanda, then we start with you with the question. So first, a couple of um, questions and thoughts from my side. As I was wondering in terms of the child protection issues that you were referring to before, if you could expand more on the on the on the level of dialogue that that the religious leaders have. So is it in terms of the policy? Of the of the actor on the use and recruitment of children, or is it on individual cases? And in that regard, I'd like to perhaps, if I mean, what's what's the relation with international law? You know, in international law, there are different standards in terms of child protection use when dealing with armed groups. So you have a, a 15 years old in in, in IHL in the Rome Statute, and then you have 18 years old in in, in the Human Rights Law Treaty. So I wonder whether I mean. If, again, if the messages the messages by the religious leaders are general messages on the protection of children, or actually they are advocating in favor of applying a rule of international law or not. And then I also like to take the opportunity to share uh, one of the questions that we got for you. Uh, that is, um, how would you say that the coup in Myanmar has affected religious actors and their capacity to influence uh, armed actors? Okay. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, I mean, basically, in relation to um, the level of dialogue, I mean, one of the one of the constraints we have, you know, I touched on, is that these are these are behind closed doors dialogues that take place, um, and so that um, in that respect, um, and and I I think that perhaps the the reason that they are effective dialogues is that they are they are behind closed doors that that. that um, you know, it's not like a naming and shaming approach that, is, that it takes place. So it's there is a level, I think, of speculation in relation to uh, what what you can say about what what actually is is, is being said in those in those uh, in those rooms. I, I think you can certainly say that um, at the very practical level, um, the um, these actors do not think that it's good for the Kachin cause for the KIO. KIA to be listed by the Secretary General, and I think that is definitely part of what will be discussed in relation to that. Um, that, um, that there's a sense that um, that um, it's definitely negative for the struggle to have to have that uh, negative publicity. Um, we do know that individual cases do form part of the discussions. That is definitely the the case, you know, for sure. That um, the individuals will approach uh, church actors um, in relation to uh, when when uh, when, when children uh, um, are, are used or recruited, and will work with them to try to get those children um, out out of the forces. So that's definitely the case. Um, in terms of your second question, yeah, I, I think it's a similar thing. It's really difficult to know exactly um, how, how much of it is of, out of what you might call a, a principal position of. You know, for instance, like a straight 18 position, or how much of it really very much comes to um, trying to kind of uh, avoid this kind of publicity. Um, in relation to the uh, the question uh, about the 
the coup. It, to be quite honest with you, um, it's still very, very difficult to say. Um, I would honestly say that um, for us, we're we're still um, in the process of re-establishing um, our, our kind of research since the coup took place. It's been it put us in a very, very difficult position to get um, um, consistent and uh, reliable research information simply because of because of the security situation in the country and not wanting to put obviously people at risk uh, in in that respect um i would certainly say at the moment um that um it's it, it's a challenging environment for for nearly everybody um working in uh, trying to operate in uh, in 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 myanmar at the moment um and i would say that um um yeah it, it's something that we need to try to learn and understand what, you know how that has actually influenced um, the role of religious actors and at the moment i yeah i can't i wouldn't even speculate um, yet thank you very much chris uh i have to I, I i think i added this but i should have added that the last question was from the audience um so now we go to a question that we have for uh Dr. Uh, Mulanda uh, Jimmy Juma from, we have a question from Mohammed, um, who thanks you very much for your presentation. He would like to know how the religious leaders in a, a political environment um, are uh, perceived by the armed actor uh, they are engaging with in the DRC. Is it considered as an opportunity or a challenge in terms of uh, influence, uh, influencing armed actors' behaviors? Uh, thank you for the, the question, uh, Mohammed. In, uh, in Congo, religious organizations and leaders uh, are, are seen in positive light uh, with uh, uh, those engaged in armed conflict, armed groups, even uh, 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 the armed forces. And this comes from the fact that uh, they, they, they play by the principle of neutrality in the process. And so they have developed this trust uh, from all sides of the, the conflict, be they armed groups or uh, armed forces or in, in the country. Uh, and because of this trust, the, they are able to, to build bridges uh, between uh, the, the warring uh, factions and armed groups and the local communities which help them to facilitate the, the reintegration process. Um, the, there are places, for example, where for you to, to live from one point to another, like for, for example, from Butembo to Beni, which is one of the hot uh, spots or areas where with a lot of armed activities, you need to, to travel with a bishop or, or a pastor for you to feel safe. Uh, because the pastor is able to talk to these people and because of his influence and leadership and trust, um, you know, you are able to, 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 to travel in those, those areas. I happened to do that at some point my, myself. Um, even international organizations like United Nations Peacekeeping Mission, for them to reach out to some of the combatants, they travel to those places with, uh, with uh, uh, religious leaders. Um, whether this is what uh, the consideration is that this is an opportunity more than a challenge. It's an opportunity in the sense that it allows, um, you know, religious leaders to be able to play a critical role in, in peace building. Of course, there's an aspect of challenge in it because of mainly because of resources. And sometimes, for example, a combatant would like to disarm and hand over their weapons and they go to the church leaders and the church leaders don't have means to, to help them reintegrate back in the community. A uh, few weeks ago, I think it's about three weeks ago, one of the, the organization, the religious organization we work with, uh, received uh, two uh, combatants who actually wanted to hand over their weapons. They want to stop fighting. And so they didn't have really resources to help them reintegrate, and that becomes a challenge um, in uh, in the process. So that's uh, yeah, what I, I can say about this, uh, Mohammed. Thank you. Thank you very much for this. And and we have two questions for Pierre. Um, so in, in the same order as we got them, the first question is by Rebecca Sarum. 
um, who thanks you very much for uh, your fascinating presentation. And she says that uh, you mentioned in your talk that uh, humanitarian negotiations, um, you mentioned, and, and humanitarian negotiations and also peace negotiations. Uh, could you elaborate on where you think the humanitarian peace negotiation line is drawn? Also, have you, find that, have you found that some humanitarian actors do not want to be perceived as participating in peace negotiations, as this might compromise the humanitarian principles? And there is another question, but I'll let you first address this first one. Sure. And uh, no, thank you very much for the question, Rebecca. Um, and yes, I mean, I've, I've, I've kind of grossly conflated the two um, humanitarian uh, negotiations and peace negotiations. I think where we draw the line is but in our paper, we, we tend to see humanitarian negotiations as more granular and related, for example, to, I don't know, individual actions such as I don't know, access to humanitarian assistance, um, um, liber like um, interventions in relation to prisoners of war, and whereas peace negotiations tend to be more, um, I suppose, systematic, um, and 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 try to find basically a settlement to you know a a, a broader, I suppose, um, a broader confrontation. In relation to your to the second part of the question, um, we haven't really focused on that. So I like I don't feel like I'm in a position to um, um, answer that, uh, let's say, in, a, in an informed way. My understand my my sense from um, my experience uh, with and in Colombia has been that um, it is mostly related to human rights organizations as opposed to humanitarian organizations. And human rights organizations certainly. Uh, try to engage in both. Um, so humanitarian uh, negotiations, although they obviously they generally are not uh, officially involved in those, they tend to um, sort of get from the back door, uh, but also to be very proactive in the uh, peace negotiations. I don't feel completely qualified to answer the question about humanitarian organizations, so sorry about that. Thank you very much for this, Pierre. And the last question we got is, uh, when confirming the evidence about the influence capacity of the Catholic Church into armed actors' behavior in Colombia, were they equally influential to all armed actors? And what were the IHL protection concerns, thematic areas that were able to influence that uh, or minimize or address? Uh, I assume that by uh, all armed actors, it is referring to all armed groups and uh, state forces. Yeah. And Thank you very much, Omar. This question actually uh, allows me to uh, sort of brings into the discussion also the uh, issue of the theology of liberation, la teología de la liberación, uh, which I haven't mentioned in, uh, in my presentation, which obviously had a strong influence, especially on the ideology of some armed groups, like, like for example, the ELN. Um, we, uh, we haven't yet done the, uh, the empirical work, so I, um, I think my answer is going to be more, uh, I guess, hypothetical. Um, I would imagine that the capacity of the um, um, uh, religious actors and the Catholic Church more generally to um, get traction with one group as opposed to the other depends also, of course, on the uh, on the ideology of the group. And so I would imagine that, for example, the uh, the ELN. Uh, would be much more receptive to certain messages coming from certain sectors uh, of the church, uh, as opposed to, for example, um, I, I, I would imagine like uh, the, the, the FARC or like even more groups such as uh, um, paramilitary groups uh, or um, like the, the, the so-called backing, the, the, the criminal, criminal gangs. Uh, but again, this is something that probably we will be able to answer in a more systematic way once we have done the uh, the field work. Um, I don't know whether that answers your uh, question. Thank you very much, Pierre. Um, so it, it is actually on time. It's it's great that we finished. Um, thank you very much to to the three of you and for for your great presentations and to the audience for. Um, also intervening and, and asking questions uh, to the to the presenters. I think this was a very good and positive um, discussion in which we've heard about experiences from uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Colombia, and Myanmar. And I invite you to continue uh, listening to the next presentations that are going to be on on 
Libya and also on Jordan. And then there are going to be other uh, discussions on Syria and Yemen later today. Um, thank you very much. And I'll see you all at the next meeting, which is at um, in half an hour. Exactly. Thank you very much.